We did the dipole was the last thing we did. So today we've got to do integration. And uh, I like that dipole because, as I told you last week, it sets up the geometry, similar geometry for a uh, for a charge, a linear charge distribution, which we will do right now. I'll go ahead and set that up. I'll jump right on in. All right, so let's go ahead and throw up our axis. Very similar to the axis that we threw the other day. We'll start over here. So we're going to try to get a three dimensional representation. Just so I'm sticking with my notes, I'm going to make a Probably from here on out, I have the Z axis pointing straight up. I don't know if I did that the other day, but of course it doesn't matter. So if that's the case, X has got to be out. And Y is a uh, horizontal axis, positive axis pointing to your right. Now, what we're going to do is uh, this. Uh, a uniform line of charge. Yeah. So this is going to be a finite line of charge. We'll do this problem and then we'll take the charge to infinity to show what happens there. Um, we'll do what we call limiting cases for our final solution. And I'll we'll describe what that means when we get to it. But uh, it's basically, you know, just take, let's say that we had like a, you know, it's a very thin line of charge and it's one dimensional, meaning we're gonna assume that the cross section, it'd be like a string, like a sewing string, right? If you, technically a string is probably a cylindrical shape, but it's the area, cross sectional area is so small that, you know, it's like a point. Uh, and in this case, it'd be kind of like taking point charges and stringing them end to end, maybe. Uh, we're going to say something like that. But I'm going to, because of the symmetry, I, I, you know, symmetry is important. I'm actually going to draw a shape as opposed to just lining up charges on the z-axis. But that shape will be charged essentially with a linear charge distribution, meaning there are no dimensions in along the 
in this case, X and Y axis, it only has dimensionality along the Z axis. So it's a very, very, very thin cylindrical charge distribution. So um, I'm gonna draw it like this. And it's also nice because, you know, you can also have a non-linear situation where it, it does have some sort of cross-sectional area. And this still will give you an idea about how to set it up. But in this case, just blowing it up to make it, make it so you can see it. But I'm going to call it a linear charge distribution. And we're going to center it. So that the bisector is the X and Y axes, or bisectors are those axes. Okay. Yeah, actually, maybe I should make it. Uh, well, I'm gonna keep. It. Yeah. Anyway, so now I guess the first thing that I want to do is, as opposed to describing the charge in terms of total charge, I'm going to describe it in terms of linear charge density. So charge density, that concept, uh, is charge per unit uh, length or charge per unit area or charge per unit volume. You're accustomed to density just being like mass is to charge per unit volume. So it's something similar to that, but just for charge, not mass. And we can describe it over whatever geometry you want. Classically, conventionally, it's per volume. But it can be per area. You can smather charge over the face of this board, and it's just over the area. So it's charge per unit area. Or you could put it along the line of a like a sewing string. And if you're assuming linear geometry, then it's charge per unit length. And we have different symbols to represent each. I think probably row is what you had for, you know, uh, right, let's put a little side note over here, uh, charge density. So, uh, charge per unit length. So, yeah. So, lambda is the symbol that we generally use for, uh, and it's total charge per unit length, L. Um, you know, it will define a verbally charge and length. Sigma is what we use for area, so total charge per unit area, A or whatever. Also, yeah, I should, should also say it can be a total charge or we can have a differential charge. So it can just be part of it. So it might and the differential length will be whatever the length of the coordinate, so in this case, z. So that could also be a dq over a dz, where, right, where the dz would go, and then this would go from, you know, L over 2 to minus L over 2, so you would get the whole length if you integrated. So same thing here, this could be a dq per unit area, dA, and then you could describe the area however you want. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, Charge per unit area. And of course, then we use a symbol rho for uh, volume charge density. And sometimes people put a little C or E there just to distinguish between, or Q, uh, just to just so that you know you're talking about charge instead of mass. Whatever. This is the context, so I'm not going to continue with that because we're just talking about electrostatics, but uh, just, you know, so you might see that somewhere. And also total charge per unit volume. I usually put hats on my thing to mean volume, and that could be differential Q over dV. D. And that equals charge per unit volume. Okay. 
as I said, in this particular problem, we're going to be using equation one. Now, um, yeah. So, I should probably write the problem out for you. So, the problem is very the same wording, really, that we did the other day. We found the electric field at a point P along a bisector. So, this is just the field point. There's no charge there. Find E at point P along a bisector, a distance, in this case, Y, away from the... Uh, Find the electric field at point P a distance Y along the bisector of a linear charge distribution of length Uh, L and charge density lambda. So that's what it would look like uh, if you saw the problem written out, some version of L. Distance. Okay. Okay. A little more description for you. Actually, let me make this a little bit better. Just be here. Okay. Three dimensionality, perception, everything. So this should look something like yeah, e. And be coming out like that. Maybe we could break this up.
Make that a little better. A little, a little more three dimensional. Now, uh, again, you know, this is a very thin. In fact, when you see the word thin, it implies that you disregard the cross sectional area. So I'm just blowing it up. It's kind of a microscopic thing or whatever. So thin. linear and uh we've got to make it so in the end so we'll make the charge density is usually just denoted something like this so lambda charge density and you know positive i didn't say that i should have probably put that in there but uh a positive charge density lambda plus let's say you don't have to put the plus there, but just, you know, you want to distinguish whether it's positive or negative because you need to know what the field lines look like. Now, I'm going to... Um, one, of the, one of the ways, I guess... Eh, so... Let me come over here a little bit and just redraw this. So this is really zoomed in, but if we zoomed out, if it's then it's like I'm gonna go and I want you to really think of it like you know protons or something that you're just placing end to end. But you know, when you zoom out, you might not see the the distinguished individual charges. And in that way, you know, you might it might look like some sort of cylindrical charge distribution. Something, you know, like something like this, where the width is an angstrom, like, you know, of the of the cross-sectional area, the, the diameter, right? So that's really more what I'm trying to describe here. Um, yeah. I guess I could have drawn it like that, whatever, I don't know. But I want to do it like this because technically the charges are smaller, actually, I know it doesn't really make sense, right? Because it's an elemental unit. But it could be like the size of a, and actually the angstrom is the size of the of the nucleus, which is a proton and a, the smallest nucleus, the hydrogen, which is a proton and a neutron. So even smaller than that. But you know, charge and volume are two different things. So when we say a point charge, we're really talking about it's something actually smaller than a proton. You know, when we were to last week, we were talking about like take a point charge distribution. I made it circular and I said, oh, okay, if it's positive and it goes out like that. Technically, this thing is point charge is a, is a theoretical thing. It's something smaller than, you know, it doesn't have any size or shape. So you could have something physically smaller than a proton whose charge is the charge of a proton. I know that doesn't really make any sense, right? Because physically, we think that things that are smaller than that. Actually, the elementary particles, they, uh, you know, they have still increments of the elementary unit, but not but smaller than the elementary unit. Whatever. All I'm trying to say is that uh, this thing is so small that we're assuming it's uniformly charged and it, uh, we don't want to really think about the individual charge, at least I don't whenever I'm talking, thinking about the geometry of how I'm setting this thing up. Um, it's density, right? So, yeah. So if that density is spread over uniformly, I can think of it as just looking at this equation right here, this, this portion, if I solve it for well, ultimately, if we're trying to find the electric field, the formula that we're using is an integral version of the formula that we have been using. In other words, what I'm trying to explain, not very eloquently, is that, sorry, equation one, that our, you no, know, well, 
if I had individual charges and I was at, at some point like this, and we know that a point charge, it has the distributions that I just said. So this charge here, for example, the first one, it's going to have field vectors that kind of point out like that, right? Greatly away from it in all directions. But then this guy does the same thing. In fact, let's take one way down here somewhere because they're all going to have that. But like this guy is also doing that, right? As field lines going out like that. So all of these individual point charges, they're going to make a contribution at this point, right? This line is going to be, I don't know, that may that line goes through there and here, this one goes through there. And this guy, you know, so that's, so at this point P, it's going to be a superposition, not of discrete charges, but essentially of, now here I've kind of made it look like discrete charges, but really once we think of the charge as smathered over the geometry of this uh, object, which is, as I said, linear geometry, we can really just think of, we have to break this object up into its different differential charge elements, which could be, you know, it's infinitesimally small. So, and, and you also want to exploit the geometry of the thing. Now, in this case, I made it linear. So it's really point charges that look like this, but still, I'm, because I blew it up, I've got to, I'm going to stay consistent with the geometry of my, you know, my, uh, my shape, which is cylindrical. So I can break this up into very infinitesimally small differential elements that look like this, DQs. And from a mathematical point of view, a DQ is really, it's even smaller than like the charge of a point charge. You know, it's arbitrary. Like we're not putting a number on it, but whatever it is, it's infinitesimal. We're, we're breaking up an infinitesimal amount of charge over an infinitesimal amount of space that that charge occupies, which in this case is length of the charge distribution. So this is my DQ. And in that way, as I showed here, all you know, the, if you go for a very infinitesimally small charge distribution, basically it's a point charge. Uh, and so if I were to draw the field charges, the field lines, they would look like this very far away. And again, the point is that I'm gonna take the differential E field due to that differential charge at that point, figure out what it is, and then add it to all the differential charges as I go from the length uh, L to minus L. Okay, I didn't put that in. So this is length L here, or minus L, and this is length um, to the plus L and minus L along the z-axis. All right. I hope that makes sense. No, that's it. Let that sink in while I go next.
All right. Oh, that's what we can. Okay. No. Um. Now, Green ball. Oh, yeah. Okay, so yes, uh, what are we doing? Electric field. So if I if I draw in all of these DQs, I know uh, I have just like with the dipole moment, I've got a symmetry that's going to be set up that I can exploit or look at, you know. All these in here. In other words, whatever height this is at, which is some L, some something Z, then there's going to be a charge element the same distance below the bisector uh, in the negative direction. So, for example, let's say that I take a DQ here. Since it's positive charge, and by the way, if I look collectively at the well, yeah, we'll see that in a second. Secondly, so if I take just that DQ, I know that if it were like a point charge, it would have a radial electric field line pointing directly from that point, you know, the the center of that point through the center of my point P, the center of that charge element through the center of point P. I'm going to use red to draw a line. 
that would represent the distance from that charge element to the point P. And that line I'm going to call R. So it's coming from here through. All right. So that, you know, you can call that R plus representing, I don't know, because they're both plus, so whatever. I'm just going to call it R. I think I called it R plus when we had the dipole and R minus when it was, you know, the positive charge and then R minus for the negative charge. Here, let's just make it R. Right? It's a vector, it points in that direction. And since it's a positive charge, I know that at point P, the direction of the field is going to be radially, you know, away from the center of DQ through that point. So the electric field associated with that charge distribution, that charge element, excuse me, DQ, uh, is going to be called, uh, well, it's just DE. It's not the total field. It's a differential element of the field due only to that differential charge uh, element. So I'm going to call that DE. And it's going to point along that direction. So that's DE from the top. In fact, I should call it, it's, it's not the total. Field, so it's got to be, I got to give it a subscript. Like with before, I could call it DE plus, but Well, actually, no, it is DE. Yeah, it's just call it DE. DE. Yeah, it is DE because D represents just, it's, it's not the total. And then from down here, I would also have one, you know, same distance below. It's going to be pointing along that direction. So I'm not going to put in the R because I don't want to get too messy, but I'm just going to say the DE is going to be pointing like that. Right? So we can see what's happening here, right? Each of these components are going to have an X and Y axis. A X and Y component. So the Y, sorry, a, a Y and Z component. There's no X component because of the nature of how I set it up. Uh, I'm in the X, Y plane. Um, and I know this looks like circular, so it would have to, but again, we're linear geometry. So linear means it doesn't have a width, even though I'm drawing it big enough so you can see it. So it looks like it does. So anyway, I don't want to go through that again. I just said that, right? So that's what's happening. It's just a two-dimensional problem, really, from our perspective. And those dimensions are going to be the DE is going to have elements within the Y and Z axis. So, going on, testing, testing. I don't know why my device is just arbitrarily cut on like that. Now, I hope you can hear me. So, you should be. Yeah, this is saying that coming through. Anyway, uh, I'm going to get a DEZ here. And of course, the DEZ here. And we get DEYs along here. Okay. So I guess the first thing to see is just from symmetry, the DEZs are going to cancel. So over here, and you know, I could go ahead and integrate it, but it, it would cancel out. Um, so the total DE has two components. DE, um, y along the j axis plus de um, z along the k axis so technically speaking the vector sum is not dz it's the easy de the vector vector and these are vectors now, it's not two, right? Like here, I, did, I just put a DE. It's not two of them because it's an infinite number of them because I have, you know, I'm just looking at two represented by, I guess I'll go ahead and put it in so you see where it comes from. It's a little awful like that. So it's going to be the
Let's be coming from below. It's a little work to set these things up, but you know, once you get it, and kind of fun actually. I think so. That's also an R, right? But what you see from the, you know, so technically we would have to do the two integrals and then the total E would be like the Pythagorean theorem between the two, blah, blah. But the thing is, this cancels out uh, for, because of the symmetry, right? Now, if I were not along a bisector, if I were at some length above, then it wouldn't happen and you'd have to do the integral. And, and there might be a one or two problems in your book that make you do that. But um, that's how you would handle it, where you do that integral out, do that integral out. In the end, you put in the limits, get a number. And then, but that's the vector form, right? So to get the magnitude, you have to take the Pythagorean theorem of those two things. Um, but here we can say that the Z components are going to cancel. So goes to zero. And sometimes due to symmetry. Remember, symmetry is one of the themes of the course. Uh, symmetry, specificity, perspective, and technique. So here we see the symmetry helping us alleviate some of the mathematics. So we're only concerned about this angle. Uh, so we're going to add up the Y components of the electric field of all these differential elements, VQ. And that'll give us the total field. And we're going to go from positive L to minus. Actually, that would make it 2L. So I guess it should be, if I'm saying the length, total length is L, then this is L over 2. Sorry. L over 2, and then minus L over 2. I mean, it doesn't matter. I could have made it 2L if I wanted to, but since I put L down there, and since that's what I have in my notes, that's what I'm going to go for. So I'm screw up. Okay. So we're almost done with uh, kind of the setup here. So DE has the form of its Coulomb's law form. So DE, so technically, you know, you integrate both sides, you're gonna get E net, but um, yeah, so I integrate both sides, right? And over here, I'm gonna get the total field, E. And over here, I've gotta work it out. What is it? Well. I can define an angle that the R makes with the x-axis. I'm going to call that angle. Is that what I did here? Oh, uh, yeah. What are we doing? So you can define it relative to various places. But here, I guess, right? Yeah, so here I want to make that angle we're talking, calling it theta here. And so the cosine of theta, dEy is equal to dE times the cosine of theta, right? Because if that's theta, then this angle here is also theta, but the y component is the cosine. So uh, this becomes uh, E is going to be equal to the integral of DE times the cosine of theta along the y direction. Now, the thing is, when you do an integral, anything in that integral that changes, you have to write it in terms of the integration variable. Now, here I've got DE, but I'm going to use Coulomb's law to switch it up. So DE, we know that E is equal to KQ over R. But if it's a DE, then this is going to be K. Uh, dq, not over r, but r squared, r squared, 
cosine of theta. So the E, I guess, comes out of the integral. So K sub B, that is, comes out of the integral. And uh, it's not, it's, you know, it's minus L over two to L over two. And so it's not an indefinite integral. Now all, so all these things, so Q obviously changes, the amount doesn't change, but the actual DQ changes, not the DQ, right? Because I'm going from one. So as that changes, the angle also changes here, right? And R, does R change? Yeah, R also changes. So the thing about integration is that whatever changes inside the integrand, you have to write it in terms of the integration variable. Otherwise, you know, you've got a problem. So we've got to find what both R and theta are in terms of the integration variable. And once we do that, then we, when we have all variables in terms of my, our integration variable, which I'm calling DQ, then we can go for, uh, then we can integrate. Now, before I do that though, I'm going to change it up a little bit. I'm not going to integrate over charge. I can, but in physics, we use the charge density thing to convert from an integral over the charge to an integral over coordinates. In other words, because that's just, I won't say it's inherently easier, but it's the way we teach it, and for most people, it's easier to see it that way, right? We think in terms of space. It's a, yeah, I don't know. Um, you don't have to, but you, but uh, we. That's the way I teach it, and the way and it's the way most books do it. So we got two integration variables. We basically we can write d by by the uh, charge density formula or equation. We can write dq in terms of dz, and so what we have is that dq is equal to lambda, which is a constant, lambda plus dz. So I'm going to convert from an integral over charge to an integral over coordinate, in this case, the z-coordinate. So when I substitute that in, actually, this is equation three, four, then I'm going to have that e equals k sub b integral from L over two to minus L over two, dq becomes lambda plus dz over r squared cosine of theta. Now the lambda can come out because it's a constant, right? uniform charge density. Now that starts to make a little bit of sense because you know you might be one you might have been wondering up here, oh my gosh, how what's theta got to do with DQ and what R? Well it's through, you know, it's through the integration variable. Because it looks like you're comparing apples and oranges. This is an angular and this is charge. This is a, a, a you know a distance and this is charge, angular distance, you know what? But so the relationship is through the charge density. Right? So we can definitely figure out that it's a little bit easier. In fact, R, right, if you think of the Pythagorean theorem, this thing here is a distance Z, some arbitrary distance Z along the Z axis. That's the value of the Z component of that particular DQ. And it's gotta be a variable, right? Because the DQ has changed. So whatever it is, it's just Z, right? Z is a variable. Now, this is not a variable. Technically it is, right? This is Y, this distance here. Now, why I we I make it a ver it looks it, I, I give it the symbol of a variable because once I choose a field point, it's fixed. But I could choose that field point anywhere I want. So technically, it's a variable. But it's a variable that for this for temporarily I'm going to hold constant while I do the problem. Then once we get the answer, we're going to talk to you about the limiting cases that we talk about in physics. Once I get the answer, I'm going to slide that field point back along and we're going to the y axis and we're going to look and see how that changes, you know, the solution we get in the limit as y gets much, much larger than the length of my charge distribution or bring it in very close uh, so that my distance y is small compared to my length of the uh, 
charge distribution. And we'll see how the electric field then changes based on those limiting cases. That's a big thing that happens in physics we do all the time. Okay. Uh, but at least now, I think you're probably getting beginning to see how we can write theta and R in terms of Z, right? Because here, it's just simple, this Pythagorean theorem. That R is going to be equal to Z squared, or the, the square root of Z squared plus Y squared. Right? And it's going to write it out. So, that we can, yeah. so R, we call this 6A. R squared is equal to basically Z squared plus y squared or 6b r is equal to the square root of z squared plus y squared. So that's that. Actually, I guess we just need r squared. So I don't even have to put that in. Yeah, so let me, whatever. And what about the, uh, well, yeah, I will need it. We'll, we'll need r, I'll show you in a minute why. What about theta? Well. For theta, we can do tangent. That's probably right. Is that what we're doing? No, it's not tangent. It's cosine because it's cosine because that's just the component. So, what is cosine theta? Well, if this is theta, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, so that's going to be y over over the magnitude of r. So we'll call that. You know what? Let's just make it seven and eight, six. Seven. Eight. So cosine of theta then is equal to adjacent y over hypotenuse, which is r. And again, r is going to be the square root of that. So if we uh, substitute those things into the uh, formula, yeah, so if I substitute seven into eight, then I can rewrite that as cosine theta equals y over z squared plus y squared all to the one half power. I guess another way to see this, if I come here, basically, this is another way to see it. What happens next? I'm just going to come from equation five and I'm going to stick equation eight into five. If I stick eight into five, Equation eight into equation five, then this becomes um, E equals. So notice. I've dropped the vector symbol, so I'm just dealing with magnitude. When I drop it here, I drop the unit vector there. So it's starting to do with magnitude. Is, uh, that's k sub b, integral from L over 2 minus L over 2 of lambda. I'm taking the lambda on out as well. So I'm going to do that. I just put K and then lambda. 
Now inside I've got DZ. over r squared, but then that's gonna be times cosine theta, which is y over r. Now, as I said, for this particular problem, temporarily the y is a constant, so it comes out. So then k sub e, lambda, y, integral, and I basically have dz over r cubed. Okay. Almost done. But r is z squared plus y squared to the one half. So basically, I've got, when I stick R in equation 7 into equation 10, right here, 7 into 10, then I'm left with the final result before I integrate. That E is equal to K sub B. E, lambda plus y times the integral from l over 2 to minus l over 2 dz over, uh, I'm going to write this like this, y squared plus z squared to the 3 half power. There you go. So that's the integral that I have to do. That's the integral that I have to do. Uh, how is it that I'm always losing my point? I haven't had it this morning at all. I have I must have placed it someplace. Not on my desk. Yeah. Okay. So this is the integral I have to work out, and that's an integral that you know if you you should be able to you should be able to do it. <laughs> Although I'll help you here. And the thing is, you know, there are patterns in these things. So once we get do one integral like this, these things kind of recur. There's you, know, you start getting recurrent integrals in physics. So uh, you know, I'll work it out once, twice for you, and hopefully you can work through it and then use that as a basis for future integrals similar to that or like it that you might have to work out. Um Turns out this is going to be, I think we're going to do a tangent uh, a ge a geometry substitution. What is it called? Trig substitution. Yeah, it works out with the trig substitution. I'm going to do it for you. I mean, you could look it up in an integral, but I always. Um... Oh, here's my point. I'm writing from the face. I find that it's kind of, I feel insecure with looking up integrals if I don't actually haven't done them once or twice. Uh, so, you want to see this at least once, though. We've probably done something like it before, but at least we have an application for it, though, just now. Anyway, uh, yeah, so that's the integral. So what I'm going to have to do now is kind of break away to an aside. Or what The way I do it is I just come over and I make a mathematical aside and I, I do the integral. And then I take it and come back and put it into the physics. This is the way I handle it. Um, yeah. And, you know, I've thought for years I probably should do it. Maybe I'll do it this semester. 
kind of writing up a specific problem solving template for integration. Because you can see this doesn't really fit the, I mean, there you can break it up into seven steps, but it kind of did, it's a math problem, really. I mean, it's a physics problem, but it, it's it's fundamentally a math problem, an integral problem. So you're just setting up an integral. Um, so the sections of my seven step process don't, you know, necessarily apply in the same way. But it, you could break it up into seven steps. So I probably might, you know, do like problem solving technique template slash integration or something. Uh, because there are steps, you know, what, what do we do? First, you know, you have to establish what the charge distribution is, right? Like what the, because, you know, let's assume we're finding electric field for a charge distribution. So establish the charge distribution. Um, I spent a lot of time describing that and talking that, about that. And uh, I guess let's say start with demonstrate. Demonstrate the problem. What is that? Just what are you doing? You know, like what kind of, you want to find the electric field of a charge distribution. Okay. And then though, you know, I guess what would suffice for explicit and implicit information, you know, the amount of charge would be explicit, of course, and the and maybe the geometry. But then, you know, you got to look at, yeah, look at the geometry of the distribution. Is it linear? Is it? area is a volume and then figure out your charge element what is your charge element going to look like and as i say it's useful to mimic the geometry of the overall charge distribution so your charge element should have a geometry that mimics that so basically determine the charge density in terms of yeah find the charge density so that would be somehow steps two and three i guess akin to that would be determine the electric field pattern associated with that so maybe that would be step four well, you know, drawing and sketching the problem, obviously, that's step four. So that's going to be about the same. What substitutes for, you know, you're going to be doing integration, I guess, you know, so then what law, right? Is it, here it's Coulomb's law, and you know, like you know, for Coulomb's law. But along with that, I would say, you know, establish the, the, well, okay, so the sketch and diagram. The elements of that would be also determine the electric field pattern, which we did. I haven't really drawn it here. It, it would kind of go out radially from there. What I did is look at each individual charge and talk about a superposition. But, uh, you know, I will draw the overall pattern in the end, I guess, when we finish. But you, you have to figure out, you know, what the field looks like as it goes through your point P. So all that would happen in step four. Step five, you know, what law are you going to use to integrate? In this case, it's Coulomb's law. And we can exploit the symmetry here, so that would go in that step. And step six, basically, I guess, would be once you establish that, then basically from equation four on is step six, writing, figuring out a way to write all of the variables in terms of your differential element. And then now we're at step seven, which is integrate. So, yeah, actually, you know what? I'm going to write that down because I think that's a good way to break it up. I've actually kind of struggled with that over the years. So that's why I've never done it, but that, that down. So let me, maybe I'll put in a new template that is specific to integrate. So working backwards, we have step seven, integrate. It's just, uh, All variables. In terms of differential. Thank you. Um, Herman integration law. 
tell me it's not integration law, tell me physical governing physical law. And uh, and then evaluate the symmetry. I like evaluate the zeros. I guess you could just say that evaluate the zeros like I did here, but that's 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 still what we do at that point in the regular problem solving technique. But in our case, the zeros are going to be associated with symmetry usually for problems like this, based on how we set it up. And you know, sketch and diagram, of course. Still step four. And again, in that we are you know, looking at the electric field pattern, considering the heat field pattern. And three, two, so that's all about. So, differential charge element, determine differential. Element. or mass element because like I said you know differential element let's say and in, in case in our case it'll, usually it's either charge or mass if we're doing gravity universal law it'd be mass here in this case Coulomb's law sorry and uh two you know the you know what does the charge distribution look like Overall charge distribution. And problem and one would be, you know, uh, again, demonstrate the problem. So in my case, uh, it's kind of, you know, there's no moving parts here, but, you know, it might not be, it might be worthwhile to kind of, you know, think about the physical situation of what that would look like and maybe have some sort of demonstration to kind of. A physical demonstration and set that up. That's always good. Um, so I, again, I'll call that just demonstrate the problem. We can have some sort of physical replica if it's practical to do so. Yeah, PPST slash integration. Okay. Um, we gotta do that integral right there. Yes, normally it would be break time, but uh, honestly, I started about thirty minutes late. So I think I'm going to break at 12 at uh, 10 o'clock. As opposed to on 9.30. And probably take this class 30 minutes beyond that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so I may have to erase something. So I think I'm going to erase all of that. Definitely keep the picture. Now, let's spread it. I'm going to make this kind of. I like to separate. You know how I like to separate out the math from the physics. So, this is going to be a mathematical aside uh, where I I do the integration. Um. 
where I just totally separate out this, separate out this integral. And, you know, we, we don't even have to think about it in the context of it's just this. It's just an integral from minus L over 2, positive L over 2 of uh, dz y squared plus z squared to the 3 halves power. Okay? Now, we can do that with trig substitution. And uh, I think I can, I'm going to use tangent. I think that's what I used. <clears throat> yeah. That over here. Big substitution. Again, let me just blow this up so you understand exactly what I'm saying. So we have a, a, a right triangle here where this axis is the variable Z. This is semi-variable, let's say Y, and this is theta here. So what we can say then is that the tangent of theta is equal to opposite, you know, opposite over hypotenuse, no, what? Tangent, opposite over adjacent, so Z over Y. So we can say that y is equal to, uh, sorry, z, optimal adjacent. Yeah. So z, that is, what? This way? Yeah. Yeah. z is equal to y times the tangent of theta. OK? And dz, if I take the derivative of that, dz, the derivative, well, y is a constant, so that's whatever. It's, it doesn't go. It's just the derivative of tangent is secant squared. So that becomes y times secant squared theta d theta. <clears throat> okay. So with that trig substitution, I have information where I can I can substitute. So my z is here. I'm going to substitute z with y tangent theta. And the dz, I'm going to substitute with y secant squared theta d theta. So I'm going to convert to an, integrate, an integral from over the variable dz to d, to d theta. Now, technically, when you do that, you should change the limits. But I'm a physicist, and I'm going to take all the shortcuts I can because that's what we do. That's how we do. So what I'm going to do, because it just looks funky, and it used to make me use, like if you convert L L of two, to, it's going to be like something in terms of tangent. You know, it's going to be something. I have to think about what it would be. I don't even know. Uh, I'm drawing a blank right now because I don't even like to think about it. Because what I can do is um, just perform the integration like a, a an indefinite integral over theta and then convert back, once I get that answer, back to z. Just put back in these substitutions and go back to integration over z and put in the limits like that. So I like to do that because... I don't know, just because it's, I see it better. Um, yeah, I guess technically you would have to put in L over 2 for Z, and then your limits then would be I don't know. You know what? I don't even, I don't know. I'm even not going to do it because I'm going to do it this way. 
So let's go ahead and put in, substitute in for um, all this stuff. So this becomes, and I'm going through this slow, but I can't do integration like this fast. I need a little more space, so I'm going to get all these things over. All right, so um, what am I doing? Yeah, substituting uh, 14 and 15 into 12. So from there we have so L over two minus L over two. DZ is uh, gonna be Y secant squared theta D theta. And um, y squared plus z squared is going to be so. So when I substitute in z, I'm going to have z squared, which is y squared tangent squared. So the z squared part is going to be y squared tangent squared theta, and all of that to the three halves power. Now I can simplify a little bit more. I'm going to factor out a y squared. And um, we'll keep this up here. So actually, I told you I, was, I, don't, need, I don't need to carry these along because I'm not going to put them in just yet. I'm going to convert back. Um, I'm going to put them in later when I convert back. So. This is going to be a y secant squared theta d theta. And now here, when I factor out the y squared, I've got 1 plus tangent squared theta. Um, and all of that to the 3 halves power. Now I can I can still take even more out. I can take the y squared out of these brackets. But when I do that, I've got to take the square root, that's the one half, and then I've got to cube it. So what I'm gonna take the the square root of y squared is y, then cubed is just y cubed. So in the next step then that's the integral of y times secant squared theta d theta over again it's y cubed comes out, and then in the brackets, then I just have one plus tangent squared theta still to the three halves power. 
Woo. Okay, yeah. So y over y cubed is just one over y squared. Let me take all this out now. Okay. Cancels. Cancels on left for two. So I have one over y squared. It's constant, so I can take it out of the integral times the integral of this is going to be secant squared theta d theta over one plus tangent squared theta to the three half power. <laughs> but there's an identity. There's an identity that uh, secant squared theta is equal to one plus tangent squared theta. This comes from the unit circle stuff, converting it to um, it comes from remember unit circle um so if you have and this is one you know, one minus one 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 so you know that here you know if this is r r is equal to x squared plus y squared r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared, right? The value here, x and y. But this is also theta right here. Um, so when you use the tangent theta stuff, like you can get all these different um, relationships. And, uh, you know, like one is equal to, you know, x cosine squared plus sine squared, you know, all that stuff that comes from that. Or, or this trig, basically high school trig. Algebra, so it comes from all that. I think we need to review that, but that's that's where you need to go to if you want to remind yourself of that and what, how you justify. It. Um, what? So yeah, I can use that in here. So basically, um, this quantity here is secant squared. And then I've got to raise that to the three halves power, right? Yeah. So again, secant squared raised to the three halves power. is just secant cubed. Take the square root, get secant cube, it's secant cube. So I can substitute 21 into 19. So my integral then, one over y squared, which is constant, integral of secant squared theta d theta over secant cubed theta. Well, obviously that cancels and I get, that goes out and down here I've got one. So, one over y squared times the integral of d theta over secant theta. And secant is one over cosine, right? Uh, cosecant is one over sine and got that right? Secant on a what? Nope. The other way around. Secant is sine and cosecant is cosine? Really? No, it's right. No, I said it right. Yeah. No, it's cosine. Yeah, because it's kind of, for me, it's always counterintuitive the way they're named. 
secant is not a sine, it's a cosine, and cosec is not a cosine. Yeah, so one over secant is same as is equal to cosine. So that's the integral of one over y squared times uh, cosine of theta e theta. Isn't that something? All of all that stuff, it, it, the integral boils down to integral over cosine. Well, that's it. And so integral of cosine is straight up sine, right? Or negative sine. Uh, sine. The integral of cosine is sine. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. Right? You know what? I should have just not asked myself. Now I can't remember. Oof. Yeah, derivative of cosine is negative sine. So the integral of sine is, the, the integral of cosine is positive sine. So now we got to go back through and now we got the answer. We start backtracking through. So the answer, answer to this thing is, so here's what I was talking about. This is a little trick that you can do. Technically, if I had converted the integrals, I have to put that in, and it's going to be like, you know, I don't know, the limits would be tangent some stuff. I don't know. This is how I do it. Um, so my, my inner answer is sine theta, right? But, and this is a constant over here, so I don't have to worry about that. I'm just, glad, I'm just going to keep that out there to the end. But I can now convert back. But I use a trig substitution to convert from uh, linear Cartesian coordinates to essentially really polar coordinates, I guess. But now I can go back from polar coordinates to Cartesian coordinates. How? We just do the trig substitution again. Sine theta is going to be equal to, this is my theta, sine theta is Z over R. Right? Where R is equal to, you know, Y squared plus X squared to the one half. And that's what you can put limits in. So here in the next step, uh, I would say, to, um, and one over y squared, but then, well, let's just do it here. So one over y squared, that becomes z over r, but then, that is equal to z over r, and r is y squared plus z squared to the one-half power. And that is the thing that I put in my limits. So the, the z goes from l over 2 to minus l over 2. Okay. I'm just going to underline these things. So these are kind of like the, the, the solution of the calculus. And then I have to just put in my limits here. Oof. Okay. Keep it rolling. So this is probably a learning curve for you, you know, like, uh, But, you know, practice it. You know, I'm giving you all the steps. Like the book, is, they have these problems in there, but they leave out a lot of steps. So I'm putting everything in. It's worth going back through. You know, uh, and we'll, once we get this solution, we'll do a couple other simple problems. If I don't, if I run out of time in class, I will add that in, you know, maybe as lectures. Because I want to get on the Gauss's Law on Wednesday. But I'll put them in as a, addendum lectures to this. We can do like a, turn this into it and make it an infinite line. I will do that in the limiting case. But then we make it a ring and then you'll know, make the ring a disk 
Uh, those are basic problems that I usually do in class and get the general answers from that. And, but the process of setting up the integration and doing it, this is something that is, is very useful. Another thing that you can do, like remember I showed you the uh, analogy between Coulomb's law and, you know, and, and universal law of gravity previously. Another nice problem to do is to replace this with an infinite line of charge and then just go back and find the gravitational, the G field at that point due to a thin line of charge. Everything will be mathematically the same, exactly the same, but wherever there's a Q, you put it in. So then a DQ becomes a DM. And your charge density lambda, as opposed to being charge over length, is, you know, or differential charge over differential length, is going to be total mass over total length or differential mass over differential length. Now, you might say, well, you know, like I just, and, and, and so every step is going to be the same. So you, you might say, well, why do it then? Well, because I know what I'm doing because I've done this a gazillion times. So I'm not just talking, like I understand what's happening. When I first, uh, when this was first presented to me, I didn't fully understand it. I could copy it and I could, you know, kind of write it down, but it's kind of like music, right? Or something. I had to just keep doing it several times. And then somehow it just, the implications of certain things sunk in. And then I understood. I don't know any other way of doing it unless you know you're a really great math genius and because for me like a lot it's, it was kind of difficult mixing the physics and the math and understanding you know like what's what for what reason you know that kind of thing so uh as opposed to just taking this and repeating it over and over like you actually have another problem that you could work out is going to you know for math is mathematically the same but physically it's different right because it's gravity and not electric field so uh I think it's worth it. I think it's worth doing that. Especially for you, those of you out there who are actually physics majors. Uh, definitely worth doing. All right, so let's put in the limits to this thing right here. Okay. Hmm, I think I'm going to run out of space over here, but one, two, three, four, break up. Yeah, so let's try it. 26. So, of course, I've got the one over y squared outside. There. And I know I, I have to keep writing stuff like that because if I don't write it down, I'll forget about it. So the first term, I'm putting... Oh, in my problem here, I made it 2L. 2L was the length. That's just a constant, it doesn't matter. So I'm gonna have L over two as the first term in each of these things. So this is gonna be L over two, then Y squared plus L over two, quantity squared and then all of that to the square to the square root one half but then minus 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 that's inherent minus right because you know bottom minus initial but then this minus, this is a minus L over two. And I'm not squaring it up top, right? It's just, it's just putting it right in. So that's a minus L over two. And then I have the same denominator. I'm just gonna bracket the denominator because I'm running out of space, but it's the same thing as this denominator. A minus and a minus is a plus. So I'm adding them and I'm gonna get Uh, 1 over y squared times um, L over 2 plus 
L over two is two L over two, which is just L. I get L here. In the denominator, I get Y squared plus L over two quantity squared, which is L squared over four. All to the square root. Yeah, that's it. That's the solution. Now, remember, this was a mathematical aside. So I'm going to, the mathematical aside is now over. I've got to take that and put it back into whatever equation I stopped with and I don't, I, I've erased it. I should have left it there. Um, what I had taken out, what I, I had taken out the K sub B, the lambda, and there was a something else. Was it a Y there? I think there was a Y there, right? Yeah, there was a Y there outside. So I'll put that back in. Now recall from whatever equation that was, I just say recall. That, you know, we had had. Um, Well, I just put it back in. So I guess what I'm trying to say is 27 goes into, but I guess I came over here. So I guess it was 15. No, I came over here at 12, so it was 13. So 27 back into 13. Yeah. And um, so then E is going to be equal to K sub B lambda plus Y times all of this. I'm running out of space. Let me drop it down a little bit. Drop it down to here, 28. So K sub B, so E is equal to K sub B lambda plus um, Y times The integral, which is all this, so that's I'll put that in bracket in I don't know braces. So it's one over y squared times all of this L over quantity y squared plus L squared over four, and all to the one half power.
this is y over one. So that cancels, that cancels, I've got one left. So then, I guess we're almost done here. 29. I've got E equals K sub B lambda, lambda plus. And then this thing, I don't need all that stuff now. So this, I still got a one over Y over there. Okay. So I'm going to kind of separate it like that. Uh, times. I'm going to put all that stuff. I'm going to put all that put it that here, one over y times, what I have is actually, I'm going to do this. we we'll keep the one over y outside. A sub b over y. But then times for now, I'll take that lambda and place it back in. So I've got, I've got lambda plus times L over quantity Y squared plus L squared over four. And the last thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna substitute back in the definition of charge density. Remember charge density is total is differential charge over differential length or total charge over total length. So this is, so the total charge is gonna be equal to the charge density times the total length. So that's just Q. And it's nice to have electric field in terms of Q so we can compare it to that of a point charge. So 30, so I'm gonna put back in the vector nature. So the E vector is equal to K sub B over Y times the total charge Q over quantity Y squared plus, um, I just do, yeah, L over four, L over two. Let me go back to that, I like it like that, squared. Um, well, whatever, it's not that bracket to braces, so L squared over four. Uh, and also that's for one half power, one half, one half, and that's in the J direction. So this is my final result. My final result. And, um, you know, you can check some basic things. When we do the limiting case, we can do that. What do I mean limiting cases? Well, just visually think about this for a second. I went over 10 o'clock. And maybe, maybe I have you, well, no one's here, but. <laughs> um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a break right now, and I'm going to have you do this. The limiting cases, meaning visually, if I were to now vary this Y, right, if I were to take this field point and vary it very far away, very far away so that I'm, you know, 400 meters, like let's, let's say that this was literally a, uh, some physical thing, you know, that big. If I get like, uh, three or four football fields away from this, what does this length begin to look like, right? It's kind of like when we look up at, in the sky, and we see stars at night. Well, what do they look like? Well, they look like point particles, right? But we know they're really spheres, but it doesn't matter what it was, even if it was a very large length of something, very far away, it starts to look like a point. So in the limit as, as the electric field, in the limit, 
sorry, in the limit, the electric field in the limit as Y gets much, much larger than L, visually we would accept, ex expect to see a point. So visually, if we could see the electric field associated with that charge distribution, it should look like the, like the charge, the, sorry, the, it should look like the electric field of a point charge. And we know what that is. It's KQ over R squared. That's Coulomb's law. All right, we derived that the other day. So what I want you to do is to prove that, is to see if you could figure out how to take the limit of this electric field as E goes, gets much, much larger than L, right? So you're, you're finding the limit, uh, sorry, as Y gets much, much larger than L, basically of this E, and see what comes out of that, see what you get. Then maybe try to go the other direction. That, you know, if I get very, very close to this, what does the field look like? And, uh, and the limit in that case would be as Y gets much, much less than, than L. So do both of those limiting cases, see if you can figure that out. And I think the book probably gives you the result, at least for one of them it does. But go ahead and do both and just see if you can. You did limits in chapter three of calculus, right? So this, this is a limits problem. And um, yeah. All right. So go ahead and work on that. Well, I'm going to take a 15 minutes here. I haven't had any breakfast this morning, which is why I'm probably feeling a little bit wonky. Okay. Maybe we should clean this up a little bit. So we can clearly see the result that we're talking about. So that result is here, this thing. And uh, uh, yeah, so E of P. It'd be interesting if someone could maybe, if, if you, have, you have a graphing calculator, you could maybe put this function in. Just take a look at what that looks like. Um, well, I'm going to do something else over here. Let's, let's, uh, if I were to draw this out, um, the field lines, it would actually look something like, I guess in a three-dimensionally, let's uh, erase some of this stuff. Well, actually this is the field at that point. So yeah, drawing the field configuration of this and the field at that point is slightly two different things, but it still would help to give an idea of what it might look like at that point. Um, yeah, in general, the field lines associated with the distribution are the following. So electric field lines, let's just talk about that field line. So as I was saying for a point charge distribution two-dimensionally, it looks like this quantity. But three-dimensionally, it will look more like it's like a porcupine kind of thing. I don't know, it's gonna be hard to draw it, but uh, you know, it's it's actually something that kind of looks like that situation. Coming out over here. And then, you know, there's stuff on the top, the bottom, on the back, it's coming out like that. No. All right. Like that. This thing <clears throat> uh, might look more like, again, three dimensional figure. You know, somewhere in the middle, it's, it's, the field lines are coming out like this in the center of the distribution, more like around the other side, be coming out like that. Now, when you get to the top, you start to get what called what's called edge effects, where it starts to kind of bend like that, kind of curve out. 
Uh, maybe there's no charge on the top. Uh, I guess in our case, we say it was uniform. So if there is charge on the top, it comes straight up like that. There's no charge on the top and there's nothing there. But the edge effects with something like that. And then of course, they're coming out here too on the side, like that straight out. Yeah. You know, from the top down view, that's a side view. Top view. It actually looks more like a point charge. I'm looking straight down the top. You know, it looks like a circle there. So the field lines coming straight out at me look something like just points coming directly out. But then on the side, the field, you know, is doing, it actually looks like a point charge, something like that. But when we're at a point, what does that distribution look like? Uh, so, you know, you want to kind of, this is more of a right brain picture or representation. So think of these pictures kind of coming out in all directions. But if I'm localized at a point, it, it looks, it has a certain perspective, right? Certain perspective at that point. Because again, remember, and that's the other thing to keep in mind that even with field lines, they're just a representation. If you could actually see the field, it wouldn't look like lines coming out like that. Like that that's not how fields would actually appear. In fact, there's really no way to, to, to pictorially represent them exactly. Some people would say maybe a cloud and like when you get closer to the distribution, the cloud is like a fog cloud would be would be more foggy, but even that's not uh, truly because you know a fog doesn't have direction, right? So the the fog model would be indicative to some degree of the magnitude of the field as it approaches uh, the charge distribution, but it certainly wouldn't give me an idea of direction. Now this kind of does a little bit of both. Because as you move, you know, when you get closer to the charge distribution, the field lines are denser in the same way that a fog cloud would be denser. And so that gives indication of the trend of the magnitude as you move away from the charge distribution or closer to it. And of course, because they are arrows, they would also indicate direction where fog, a fog model does not. However, even this uh, fails to fully represent what a field looks like. So you just have to kind of use your imagination to, um, to extrapolate. But again, graphing uh, the scenario does help to uh, help to your, to guide your intuition and in understanding what you're talking about. Field lines have certain characteristics. Uh, the, the electric field is proportional to the density of the field lines. So that's one property. Well, the density of field line. <clears throat> so number density. Of E field lines. Is proportional to the magnitude of the field. What we say is that the density of E field lines is proportional to field strength. And we represent field strength, we represent it, you know, as out here, I've 
I've been representing it as ease of P, meaning it's the electric field at point P. But in general, we would represent as E sub R, meaning the electric field at some distance R away from the source of the field. And the magnitude of the field strength, the one way to write it is with this vector notation with absolute value large. What does this mean? Uh, the number of density of field lines. Let's give a, a kind of representation with a, an example with uh, a point charge. Now, again, don't be thrown off. You might ask, you know, we just did all this mathematics. And why are you talking about field lines? Uh, because that's actually what we calculated. It's the magnitude of the field. And one way to represent it is with this cap, this, this algebraic equation in the end, but you know, there's a general record. We haven't talked about it formally, so this is a way to do it. And we'll come back and then look at this closer. But I want you to, you know, one of the philosophies also of my teaching is, you know, to, to mesh both left and right brain aspects of a concept. So much of what we did in this lecture is, you know, left brain, right? Is working out a calculus problem. But there's other perspectives by how to understand the field at that point. And a lot of what I'm discussing here is more of kind of a right brain perspective of other ways that we can represent field strength and field. And ultimately it's the combination of both the intuitive right brain perspective and the analytical left brain perspective, all of those things together help us to understand what it is we're talking about. This is the most one of the most important properties of uh, field lines that, so if you have a point charge, let's say a little charge Q, right? Well, we know that the field in two dimensions, the field is doing this kind of thing. So number density, right? Density is gonna be, we've already talked about like, you know, charge density. We can talk about mass density. We can really talk about something like it's a number density. It's literally like the number of something that's in a certain area, right? So, or a certain region. In this case, we can compare the number of lines to the area or across either the circumference or the, you know, or the area. Uh, again, density can be in terms of one, two, or three dimensions or any other number of dimensions. Uh, linear density is number per unit lot, length, uh, area, number per unit area, you know, area, or volume density, which is how it's usually introduced when you first have the concept of density in high school, is something per unit volume, mass in that case. But you can define a density with respect to anything. So it can be the number of any kind of quantity. Uh, divided by whatever dimension you want. Um, so here, what we're going to do is the number of field lines, and we can either use circumference or area. I'll just I'll use area because that's what's done a lot. So if we come out a certain radius r, right, r one, we could map out a radius and either calculate the circumference or the cross sectional area within that thing. If we come out another radius R2, then we could also calculate a number density associated with that. Right, it's radius. So let's just calculate and see which one is greater, right? So if we have um, the number of lines per unit for area two, uh, and what we're saying is that the electric field is proportional to that doesn't give you the exact value, but it gives you a relative value. So what is the electric field at point R2? So ER2, well, it's gonna be proportional to the number of field lines uh, divided by the area at position two. How does that compare to the, uh, the electric field at, at position one, R1? Well, that's gonna be not equal to proportional. 
that's proportional to the number of field lines per area one. Well, our intuition tells us that the field strength, you know, we know that it goes as one over R squared. If we represent it, we've already done that, but let's just quickly do it again. If we drew a graph of the field magnitude, E sub R, you should be seeing this in your books, E of R uh, versus R, well, we know it goes as one over R squared law, the inverse square law. Right? So when we get close to the field, it gets stronger and blows up at the center of the charge. But when we move far away, it goes to zero out at infinity. And it does that uh, in the functional form of one over R squared. So just looking at this picture, we would expect that the electric field should be greater at position R1 as compared to position R2. And if we just do a very quick analysis of these things, we see that that's true based on this idea of the number density because we only have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight lines. That doesn't change, it's eight. But as you move farther away, the space between the lines changes, which means that the cross section area at any point that you could define as you move away is larger. So if you look here, E, let's call it E2 is equal to eight divided by, and what is the area? Pi r squared, pi times r squared, or r2 squared, uh, not, again, not equal proportion. And E1 is equal to eight divided by pi r1 squared. Well, if r1 is greater than r2, then E1 is gonna be less, sorry, so if R1 is less than R2, which it is, then E1 is gonna be greater than E2. So even though it doesn't give you an actual quantitative uh, value, you can see that uh, qualitatively, we can compare uh, this, we're just looking at the, the trend in the electric field lines, gives you an idea of the trend in the field strength as you move uh, closer to or away from a specific charge distribution. Another important property that I wanna stress here is that wherever an electric field crosses a charge distribution, or interacts, intersects with a charge distribution, it has to do so at a perpendicular to the surface, if the surface is flat, or a perpendicular to a tangent to the surface, if the surface is closed. If, if the circuit is, if the surface is, uh, is curved, not closed, curved. So here, this is not a flat surface. But you see that everywhere I draw a field line, it is perpendicular to a tangent at the point where it crosses the origin or the, the, the charge distribution. Obviously, if it were a flat surface, then it would still be perpendicular to the point, but that point also, you know, it would mean that it was perpendicular to the surface as well, again, for a flat surface. So field lines are perpendicular to the uh, point where the field crosses, inter interacts or intersects with the charge distribution. Um, I need to keep this over here, so I... Uh, I apologize, I need to erase stuff here. So a second property is that field lines are perpendicular to 
to a surface source. That's O U R. Or tangent to the surface. Depending on what the surface is curved or flat. Also, we can say that field electric field lines never cross. Ever. I like that uh, Taylor Swift song. Never, ever, ever cross. So you could probably say a couple more things, maybe, I don't know, but uh, we can when we talk about metals, specific types of surface. This is more generalized. This is for both metals and conductors, but. Again, we'll say a little bit more about field lines and electric field when we get to conductors and electric potential uh, two chapters away from them. For now, that's, that's all we need for this. That field lines are proportional to the number density. They are perpendicular to the surface or tangent to the surface and they never cross. How are we doing? Brittany, I haven't picked on you today. Are you there? Yeah, maybe I should move it. We're not picking on you. Yeah, no, I'm just kidding. I haven't acknowledged you today. Positive. Uh, uh. Us having today. So, Gina, you've been responsive. Uh, Melanie, I think that's on it. Melanie, responded. Melanie, Melanie, you there? Sorry, yeah, I'm here. Hey, how are you? So, how are you feeling about this? Uh, you were the first person in class today, I think, not you? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, I think I get it. Yeah. It's pretty. Yeah. Cool. Good. What, uh, where are you in your mathematical, mathematic preparation? What uh, math are you in? Uh, I don't know. I'm taking it somewhere else. Oh, okay. But like, what, like, how far have you gotten? Have you I'm assuming, I mean, you had to have calculus one already, right? Yeah. Uh, have you done calculus two? I think I'm in the process or like halfway through. It's weird how they do it over there. Oh, oh, so I'm, I'm not, not sure. It's not just a straight up calculus course, but how? how yeah, how, I think how, it's a two part system. I'm not completely sure how they do it. I see. Yeah. Uh, but you've done. Uh, differentiation, you've done integration? Yeah, yeah, I've done all that. Um, what about vector analysis? Um, right. I think so. So does any of this look familiar with the integrations technique? Yeah, yeah, it looks familiar. Do you remember like the day we did a trick, I've erased a lot of it, but uh, we did a trick substitution to get down to this result. Was that familiar to you or not? Uh, yeah, that was familiar. I don't remember all the like substitutions and stuff, but like it made sense. Okay, good. Well, as I was saying, in order to be efficient, you don't, what I would do is just start like use my notes to just learn that. You don't have to go back and like do the whole chapter and trick substitution if you like that, but fill in that. Like that's going to take a lot of time and you've already done it once and you don't remember it, right? Because you weren't focusing on a specific thing. This is taking what you're doing, what you have done, and being very specific about it. 
So one way to practice and to get you know up to speed is just do this problem over, you know, and focus on that. And if you do use a calculus book, just specifically look for the thing that I did in the calculus book that's that, not the whole chapter. All right, because we're, we do this because these things repeat themselves in subsequent problems, these types of integral things. So that's a way to be more efficient about brushing up on the calculus. Uh, so, another, so also, Melanie, I want to ask you this. So we've got this analytical solution. I've digressed a little bit and talked about field lines in general. But now let's kind of come back to the problem. So we're at this point and we have a field distribution that, that, in other words, if we're sitting at this point and if we could see the field, then again, they don't really look like field lines, but it's the best representation we have. What we see are these kind of lines coming out, right? And at this point, they have a certain configuration mapped out by this mathematical formula, okay? Now, I mean, that's one way to think about it if you're at that point. Another way to think about it is our vantage point. Like we're at a third position, a second position, or maybe a third position, the distribution is there. We see somebody standing there, or that's where we're calculating the field. But we have a bird's eye view where we can see the field lines emanating out in space from that thing. But we can also have an idea, also based on what this corner tells us, what the perspective of that field might look like from point P. So let's say maybe that's better because we, we have a bird's eye view. We're seeing all of that, okay? Now, we also know that a point charge, that's the basis by which we started. The force on a the charge, then we looked at the field. So this is kind of the, the ground zero type of field that we understand. In other words, you always have to have a reference point, right? Uh, and a point charge, for many reasons is a very good reference point because it's universal. You know how I talked about, I don't know whether it was this class or mechanics. I guess it might've been, I don't know. But I was talking about, you know, we talk about fundamental forces or fundamental quantities. They're reference points. Fundamental meanings that means that, you know, the forces that were the initial forces in the universe at the Big Bang. What are they? You know, gravity, uh, electromagnetic, or elect I guess they were separate at one point, electrostatic force, the magnetostatic force, and we combine them for electromagnetic force. And then nuclear forces. Those were the original. So when we talk about something like a frictional force, that's not a fundamental force, but how do we understand it? we compare it to a fundamental force, right? That's really what's in the definition. It's equal to a normal force, but normal force is associated with weight, weight is gravity. So it all it kind of comes back to fundamental. Well, we, we wanna be able to think in terms of that with charge as well. The charge is a fundamental quantity, why? Because everything, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's you know, Atoms are made of protons and neutrons, right? fundamental things. And uh, if we could understand what the electric field of the smallest unit of charge, the elemental unit, a proton or an electron, then any other kind of field charge distribution, like is basically a combination of a bunch of charges together. And so, whatever field configuration that looks like, it's a natural response to want to compare that to the fundamental. So we, we want to keep in mind that the fundamental charge is, the fundamental field is that of a very small circular charge like a electron or a proton, which we call a point charge. Do you understand that? Does that make sense, uh, Melanie? Yeah, that made sense. Okay. So I want to ask you some questions. If a point charge looks like this, 
visually. And in a two-dimensional graph, it could be represented as this curve where in the center of the charge, it blows up and becomes infinite, in, infinite in that. And so therefore we say it's not defined at the center of the point charge or at the point where the charge exists. But if we go out to infinity in the other direction, very far away, out there at zero, and it gives a, and it trends as one over R squared. So those are the pictures we have of what the point charge, the field of a point charge looks like. Yeah. Well, right now we wanna take this field distribution for this charge and we think we wanna think about the limiting cases. That is compared to the point charge. When we take this charge distribution and we go out to infinity, can we extrapolate what that would look like? That field, that field would look like when basically we take Y to infinity or when we take Y and we come in very close to the charge and I gave the analogy earlier, like what if we're two millimeters away and you know the charge itself is a hundred meters in length. So, so that's in the limit as basically the distance is close to uh, oh, all right, close to the charge distribution. Let's take the, the first, uh, consider the first scenario where as I move farther away from the charge distribution, in fact, let's just forget about a field right now. Let's just think about the object. This object is, it's a long slim object, kind of like this meter stick. Actually, let's do this one. So you can see the whole thing in the camera. This, this ruler, that ruler is 12 inches. And when I look at it, my eye has a certain perspective, right? Like the angle if that my, the line of sight of my eye makes with the top and with the bottom, that angle, I don't know, that's probably maybe 45 degrees, 50 degrees, something like that. Like that I think you call it the optical angle. So Melanie, the very the specific question I'm asking is, what happens to that angle that optical angle, when I'm like here, I'm like uh, what, 20 centimeters away. But what if I go, and I don't know if you can see, but I'm over in Hollywood. Oh, you can't see it from here, but if you look out my window there, uh, I can see Griffin's, the Griffin's Observatory from my window. So if I'm, if I'm looking at this, this meter stick, and I have a certain optical angle, put it on my desk. If I go and, you know, the Griffiths Observatory is probably, probably about like a, two miles away. So if I got two miles away and I'm looking at this same meter stick from that point of view, what happens to the optical angle, Melanie? Does it, does it stay the same? Um, Okay, let me ask you a different question. What does the what it, so what does the length of the object appear to do as I move farther away? So right now the, it has a certain length. Now if the length doesn't change, but the apparent length, what it looks like when I move farther away, what does this does what is like the length of if you move the ruler farther away from you, like it'll look smaller. Is that what you're asking? It, yeah, that's what I meant. It looks smaller. Okay. Yeah. So therefore the optical angle does not stay the same. The optical angle would decrease. Decrease. Yeah. Yeah. As I get farther away, if I get very far away, like maybe 20 miles away, this thing which was had a certain length, what does it begin to look like? Like geometrically, it's a line, but if I'm 20 miles away, it starts to look more like a what? What type of geometrical figure? Well, if it's getting smaller, Melanie? I don't know. Yes. If it just gets smaller, it doesn't stay the same, like geometrically, just a line. 
So what would you, how would you describe it? I don't know, I'm sorry. I think you're overthinking. Uh, maybe I'm not asking the question well to set it up well. I'm probably making it sound more complicated. I'm talking about optical images and all that. What does anything look like if you're so if you're far enough away from it? A dot. It looks like a dot. That's what I'm getting at. It will start to look like a point. Does that make sense, Melanie? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, that's all right. That's all right. That's all right. But you know, I like the word dot, but in physics we use point. Why? Because, you know, we call this a point charge. You know, that's the thing. It's a thing in physics. Point charge, point particle, you know, like, uh, remember, symmetry, it implies geometry. So in physics, geometry is big. Like, that's what we mean. It, these things are, uh, these are not arbitrary words that we're using. They are referencing symmetries in physics, generalized symmetry. So one way you know, to talk about that is in terms of geometry. So a point particle, a point charge, a point mass, you know, these things are not arbitrary. We're talking about that because in, in physics, that's a, you know, that is a dimension. It's the zeroth dimension. I don't know if you are, there's a really good uh, YouTube thing that came out several years ago, maybe I could put it up, like imagining the concept of dimension. In fact, I think I might find it and have you take out this movie. But uh, it's really nice discussions, like an hour, an hour and a half long uh, movie about uh, imagining higher dimensions. But a point, uh, a point particle represents actually the zero dimension. So there's a zero dimension, which is a point. Then there's one dimension or the first dimension, which is a line. Second dimension is a plane. Third dimension is a, is a volume. But you can also describe higher dimension, five, six, seven, eight, nine, not just in terms of those geometrical figures. In fact, those things like a toroid, those things only go up to like, that's a certain perspective. You know, to go up to like maybe fourth or fifth dimension. But even into the sixth and seventh dimension, there are certain ways that you can imagine what that means and what it looks like in terms of uh, universal symmetry. So, um, yeah. Anyway, that's kind of a digression. But uh, that's what I'm getting at. It looks like a point charge, point particle. So if this line has a field that looks like this pictorially and like this mathematically, what happens like if we're very far away, the field looks, the, the object itself looks like a point, which implies that the field itself should start to look like the field of a point, namely a point charge. So if we're very close in, the field looks kind of like this. But as we get farther away, this same actual field will start to look like that of a point charge. When we, and we should see that manifest somehow in this result. That is, if we take the limit of this result as y goes to infinity, or at least as y gets much, much larger than z, or 2L, so that's what we're saying, or, or the, the z coordinate that measures then in the end, that means that this should start, this equation here should start to look more like uh, case of E over Q, over, it should start to look more like this, this equation, because this is the field of a point charge. So basically, equation 42 should start to look more like this. Those are called limiting cases when we do that, when we take the limit as y gets much larger than z or y is much smaller than z. And we see what this field we get, because that's a way that we can compare the field back to a point charge or to something that we are familiar with. So that's what we anticipate we'll get. We'll do it in a minute.
But now let's qualitatively assess the other direction. What would you expect the field to look like if you're very close to this uh, line of charge? Anybody? So when we're very far away, the field should approximate that of a point charge. When we come in very close, what, we'll just take a guess. If Aaron, you wanna come back full circle? Um, what, let me help you a little bit. If I looked at the, so if this is a point charge and we're saying the field looks like that, two dimension like this, but I've done a lot of comparison of the electric field to the gravitational field. If we were out on the moon looking back at the earth, the gravitational field of the earth will look more, will look kind of like this, right? It's universal square, it's universal law of gravity or at least associated with it. And it is an inverse square law, all the stuff is the same. So when we're very far away from the earth, it looks like that. And if we go out to infinity, you know, the gravitational force goes to zero, same thing. But if we come in close to the earth, in fact, in mechanics last semester, all the problems you did were close to the earth. And when you were close to the earth, what did you say about the G field? What type of field did you approximate it as when you're close to the earth? Aaron? Acceleration? Yeah. and. That's the acceleration field. And what did we say about the acceleration close to the Earth? Um, what did it's, we say? it's constant. Yeah, we said it's constant. Well, it's not really constant, is it? No, it's not constant. When you get far out, it does this. It goes as one over R squared. But with you, when you're within a couple miles, it doesn't change much. You know, it's 9.81 here, maybe a mile and a half up in the sky. It's like 9.8999 or something like that. I don't know. Like, it doesn't change much. So for practical purposes, close to the say it's constant. But the reason I mention that is because if every, at every point we've compared Coulomb's law to the universal law of gravity, saying that they're mathematically equivalent, let me ask you the question again. If I look at the electric field, which is analogous to the acceleration field, when I come in close to this charge distribution, what would you expect that the field would look like or simulate if it also compares to mathematically to the gravitational field, Aaron? Uh, I would assume the field would be stronger the, the smaller the distance is. Okay, that's true. We got that from the line density. But can you say something else based on the discussion we just had about gravity? Uh, yeah, I'm not exactly sure. Sorry, it's, it's kind of hard. I have a repairman in my house. It's kind of hard to... Okay. All right, no worries. But thank you for your contribution. Anybody else? Just literally based on that conversation we just had. Aaron correctly you know, assessed that, you know, G is not constant, right? When you get out farther, it's one of our square. When you get close to the earth, we approximate that as a constant. And we also said that, you know, the Coulomb's law has the same form as the universal law of gravity, which means that the electric field of a point charge looks very much like the gravitational field of a point mass, right? If E is K Q over R squared, then G is capital G M over R squared. So if the acceleration field kind of be approximated to be constant when we're very close to a mass distribution, what can you say, what would you guess would be, what you could say about an electric field when you're very close to the charge distribution that is creating the electric field? Arrow. Anybody? Adrian? 
I don't know what else you want us to say. That's I would have I would have said the same thing as Aaron. I really don't know what else you want. <laughs> okay, just repeat what what did Aaron say? What did he say? Remind me what he said. I didn't write it down. I should have wrote it down. Oh. I forgot what he said, but I would have. Like, G is not constant. And honestly, I don't. Yeah, I just don't know what else you. I. I unless I'm missing uh, something. Well, maybe I'm just not seeing it well. I said that G is a constant, but we don't assume it's constant when it's close to the earth. It's yeah. constant when we. Okay, so he did say that. Like, well, well, he didn't, but he did. Well, yeah, so that's it. Like, you just, when you're close to the earth, what happens to G? I think what it's smaller. We it well, it does. No, it actually gets larger. It's smaller when you get farther away, right? Like, when you get farther away. Oh, yeah, earth, yeah. I'm mistaken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. Sorry, but it gets larger. But also, he just said what, that, you know, well, when you were in mechanics, how did you treat G? Like, you, you treated it, you, you assumed that it was a constant, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah, exactly. But it's not constant. So it can right? change. Well, you're approximating that it's a constant. But it really isn't. That's right. Yeah. So if in every other aspect, the electric field mathematically compares to the gravitational field, both in terms of force and in terms of field. And if we're far away, both of those things are not constant and go as the same kind of law, one over r squared. If when you get close to a mass, we can approximate that it's constant, what would you might expect that if you get close to a charge distribution, you can approximate about the electric field? That's the setup. I can't get into better than that. So you still have no idea what I'm leaving. Are they the same? What do you mean by the same? It's a lot of words. Like I'm trying to like process all the words you just said, but yeah, it's, yeah. It's um, the gravitational field, the electric field, if they abide by the same law, I th honestly, I think you can infer that they are, they're not the same, but at least similar. That's what I'm getting at right now. Okay. Yes, they are similar. What, I, what I'm looking for is that you might expect that the electric field would be constant. It would look like it's constant when you get close to the, to the, uh, the charge distribution. That's what I'm looking for. Very far away, it's going to look like point charge, the field of a point charge, which is not constant, it's actually this, kq of r squared. And when you get very close, it's going to look just like a constant. Um, and, you know, the way that we, well, I guess pictorially, the way that we represent that, like with the earth, with the force, gravitational force, how do we, you know, what does a constant field look like when it's close to the earth? Well, if close to the earth, we also assume that the earth is flat, not that it's circular. So very close to the earth, a constant field is just represented like that. There are lines that are equidistant apart so that the space between the lines doesn't actually change. When you zoom in close to the earth, if you could see the, see the field, it would look like, the G field would look like that. But when you zoom out, you know, 100 miles out in space, we see that those field lines are not actually parallel. They actually look like that. So for example, here, G is a constant. That's what we say, G is equal to a number, a constant. That constant happens to be 9.81. When, when you graph it, it looks like that. But in fact, when we go way out in space, G does not look like a constant. G looks like capital G M over R squared. And if you graph that thing, it looks like this, which is definitely not a constant field. And 
in reality, it would look kind of like porcupines where the lines are, are not parallel, but getting farther and farther apart as you move away. What I'm trying to say is that the electric field of this uh, charge distribution, which in reality, kind of medium distance away, looks kind of like this, where it's, you know, it's, uh, I mean, this is a very different type of field than this thing, right? It's got lines up here doing that. Out here, it points out, I mean, it's, you know, it's really a weird thing. You kind of line straight down here, then these things are curving out. Like, that clearly does not look like that thing when you're in a medium distance. But if you get very far away from this, it's going to look like this. And if you get so close into it that you can't even see the ends, then it's going to look like this. And it's going to, it's going to look like it's constant. That's what I'm saying. Does that make sense to everybody? Does it make sense now? Yes. Good, good, good. Well, that's right brain, that's intuitive, right? Now we can prove it. We can prove that mathematically by taking the limit of this equation as we get, you know, as y, this distance gets much, much larger than Z or 2L, two, two the length of the thing. When we do that, we're going to get an equation that should mimic this kind of scenario. But then if we take the other limit as Y, as Z gets much, much larger than Y, or Y is much smaller than Z, then we're going to get something that should be a constant here that looks kind of like this. That's what we would expect. In physics, whenever you do something like this, whenever you get a result, you want to analyze it in some kind of way. And this is one of the ways we analyze results, particularly with fields in physics. We look at the limiting cases. What happens when you go to infinity? What happens when you get infinite, infinitesimally close to infinity? So let's do that right now. Let's take the limit to infinity. The way we write this, it's lit it would be kind of written like this. We're going to take the limit of E at point P. Well, actually, the limit of E as Y gets much, much larger than Z. Or, yeah, something like that. So, that would be like the limit. And I'm just going to kind of take out the, the portion here that I deal with. I don't really, yeah, well, I guess. Anyway. So the limit as y gets much larger than z of this thing. So what we do, I'm going to have the constants over here, k over q, uh, q over q over k. Um, so here, one of the things we do is uh, if the, the quantity that's getting larger, we're gonna, I'm going to factor that out of the, of the radical. So I have a y, but then if I, if I factor out a y squared, I'll do this in a couple of steps. Y squared is here, then inside I have one plus Z squared over Y squared. That's to the, all of that's still to the one half. In the next step, the one over Y. Now, when I take out the Y squared, I'm going to have to operate on it by the one half. So a Y comes out. That Y that comes out of that times this Y is just still is going to be Y squared or one over Y squared. And over here, I'm going to have one plus Z squared over Y squared uh, to the one half. Now, I've got two fractions here. This is a constant, so that's not affected by the limiting case. 
But here I have one over Y squared, here I have one over all this stuff. Well, what happens is this thing in the, this guy goes to zero much faster because I'm dividing the Y squared by into this number here. Um, yeah. In fact, maybe, you know, yeah. Yeah, I don't know, it just does. Because also it's in the one half and it's, yeah. So it just goes, it goes to zero faster than one over y squared. So in the limit as, uh, you know, you did this stuff in calculus. Remember when you did like the limits, the limits like chapter three or four of calculus when we have to do limits? Um, it's that kind of thing where you have to, that kind of operation is what's happening here. It's, it's actually the same thing. Uh, where you, and I guess that was a way of, of calculating a derivative without doing the formula, right? Taking the limit, it's kind of something. This is not taking a derivative, but it's still doing, you kind of manipulate the thing algebraically so you can see when you approach uh, something from the top and the bottom, the limiting case, what it comes to. This is kind of something like that, kind of. So, yeah. Anyway, uh, this factor goes to zero faster than this factor. So the result that I get is that the electric field for y much, much larger than z is going to be, you know, all that goes to zero, well, to zero. So what I'm left with is, uh, you know what? I just screwed. That's not, that's not one over k. Sorry about that. It's k times q. I'm just bring the q over here. So it's not a one over k. It's k to b times q. Yes. So what I'm left with is k sub b. The q is still in the denominator. I'm just in the numerator and the y squared is in the denominator. So look, in the limit that y is much larger than z, look at what I get. I get the field of a point charge, which is what I expected, right? So it's gonna get the K, Q over, in this case, Y squared, but whatever. You know, it's, uh, it has the units of field. Awesome. So that's what I expect. So that means this is analytically, intuitively, if you graph that thing three-dimensionally, you get this figure, which is a very different figure from this figure. So that makes sense that it, su it suggests that this original answer probably was right. It certainly it makes sense. Okay. Now let's go the opposite direction. Let's take the limit uh, as uh, of E as uh, Z gets much larger than Y. So a very similar process, except that I factor out the, the Z. Now, um, it might look something like this. In fact, I could probably write it more like, I'm just taking the limit of that inside thing. I don't know. So what was it? So limit of, as, as Z gets much larger than Y of the same thing. So this is gonna be K, Q. I have a one over Y, and then I have, Factoring out the z squared, doing the same kind of manipulation. But there, I got to be a little bit careful. It's going to be more like z over, uh, I'm going to get a z out, and then inside I have one plus y squared over z squared to the one half. And in that limit, uh, is it going to be constant or is it going to be, uh, well, maybe it's not a constant, maybe I was. Where is it? Oh, yeah, yeah, it is going to be a constant. I have to go back to the, you have to look at it in terms of charges, but let's, let's keep, so, if I take the limit on this thing, 
then that becomes, that goes to zero. This thing in bracket goes to zero. So what I have here is, uh, yeah. So the limit, uh, so yeah, it's gonna be, so E uh, for Z much larger than Y is equal to K. Now this is gonna be Q over Y times Z. All right, so that looks a little funky. It looks like it, I might have a problem there, but I don't think I do have a problem. And this is why. Well, first of all, the position Y, we've already said that it is constant. That's a value, that's a number. That's just a specific distance away. Maybe two millimeters if it's a hundred millimeter long, so that's a constant. But what about the Z portion? I mean, effectively all those would be constants you could say because Z is a finite distance of the thing. But just to be clear, I could, I could be even more specific. I could put back in the idea of charge density. That's a better way to see that it's con that, that number, that this thing is a constant because we define that charge is equal to, well, K over two L, I guess, but L and Z, I mean, you know, the Z is really just, the total length of the object, I guess. I know that here we had it as a variable, but along the Y coordinate, the, the Z coordinate, Z really is just, it just represents the total length of the object, right? So, um, cause right now things are kind of looking like variables, but I could put in, uh, you know, the charge per unit length. So Q then is gonna be equal to uh, Lambda times the total length. So I have Q times Lambda times, you know, the total length 2L, but that's really kind of takes care of Z. I don't know, it would factor out on It's hard to, I don't want to hand wave it too much because it might look, look like I'm just making it work out. Maybe the best thing is just leave it like that, right? And understand that, um, that in this scenario, these two uh, object, these two points here, they just represent numbers. Um, you might say, well, why didn't this thing represent a number? Why isn't that constant? Well, because we're kind of looking at it as uh, going farther away from the object. So as I said, you know, for different problems, as we move farther away, we can change that even though that's an arbitrary value y, we can change that by making it larger, right? In other words, this is the thing that I was varying. Y was getting was incre getting increasingly larger than z. Here we're saying that uh, z is getting you know um, well, yeah, I guess why it gets closer because I'm kind of implying that I'm making that larger relative to the thing. So, okay, that'll work, that'll work. Let's go with that, that'll go with that. So if by that logic, I'm assuming that whatever the Y is, that's a constant, so that's good. We don't have to worry about that, that's a constant. Well, what I'm saying is that this Z is getting larger. Okay, let's go with that compared to whatever the value of that Y is. Well. If that's getting larger, then that means the charge is increasing and the length is increasing. But they're doing it proportional such that the lambda stays constant. So yeah, that's good. So, right, because, and, and understand that the Z represents the total length 2L, not just, you know, some, it's, it's, it's the length of the object because that's what we're talking about, that's getting larger. And so even though Q and Z are getting larger, they're doing it in such a way that Q over Z is a constant and Q over Z is lambda. So I could represent, let, let's just kind of hand wave that charge is equal to lambda times Z, where Z represents 2L. So if I did that, I could put that in lambda times Z over Y uh, divided by Z. So the, the Z is going, also the K is there. It is still there. So the Z's go out and that would show that in fact, um, the electric field 
looks like a constant field when we're close in. That for z much larger than y, uh, the field looks like k, which is a constant, times lambda, which is a constant, divided by y, which uh, is a constant for that problem. So that's how I would explain that. So that means that the electric field is just it's just a constant value. And if you graph that, that would look more like, like what uh, the field is close to, uh, the gravitational field is close to the Earth. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, what I would say, I would encourage you to go back to the problem we did yesterday. Oh, oh man, we just went over it. Three minutes, sorry, I didn't realize. Um, I would go back to the problem you did yesterday. So you got these two problems. You got the dipole, you got this, now this guy. Um, I would, uh, I would look at the, I would take the limiting case of the dipole. Now coming in close, that's gonna give you a mess. So maybe not doing it, going in close, but definitely taking the limit as you go farther out, that should also look like a point charge. So when you do that to practice getting a limiting case, you're gonna get something that looks like KQ of R squared. So I would do it for that. Because clearly like if you had two charges, you get far away, it starts to look like a point, same thing. Get close in, it gets a bit, get messy. So that's not necessarily true. If you're right in the center, you should get zero, but you know. Uh, that's easy, but like very close to the center, but not at the center, but close in, it's going to be a bit of a mess in there. So uh, you're not going to get something that's highly symmetric there. Well, it is symmetric, but it's hard to figure, you won't figure out so easily. So, um, yeah. Now, the other thing, the next problem that I would do is, you know, you talk about various examples. You know, you could do a problem where you don't have a finite line of charge, but you have an infinite line of charge. Now, we actually have the result. This is this, the result that you would get, a constant. But this is an easy way to get to that by doing this problem and then taking the limit of that problem. That's actually a strategy to find what the electric field of an infinite line of charge is. But you could go back and actually work on like a straight up integral problem, like we did this guy, where the limits are positive and negative infinity. And it basically is the same problem, it's just that when you put the limits in, then like you have to do like Le Hopital's rule or whatever that stuff is that you do, something like that. So it's a lot more mathematical, uh, whereas we did a trig substitute. Well, the integral is the same. You get down, you do the trig substitution, but then when you get that final result, having to put the, the limits in, you know, you would have to use some sort of technique like that. I think Le Hopital's rule is what you'd have to use. But in the end, you're still going to get this answer. So this is the way I like to teach it. Like, you know, just, so the, the finite, then the infinite line. And then what people start to do is they start to, you know, you take it and turn that line into a ring, right? So you have, if I draw a three-dimensional field like that, three-dimensional coordinate system, I take a ring and place it on, you know, kind of like, uh, trying to draw three dimensionally. Uh, so like if this is Z and this is X, the ring would be fate, would be in the X Z plane, be flat in the X Z plane. And you're still finding an electric field, a point P along a bisect. So like here, when you break up the ring, you have, you know, like the charge due to that guy but down here, you're going to have charge and field is going to be due to that guy pointing out like that, right? So basically, all of the fields would cancel in both the x and y direction, so the x and z direction, and the end result would just be a field in the y direction. Um, that problem I would probably do first. So then once you get that result, then you can do the problem that's the next section in the book, which is the, the disk, just you know, clouding in. And basically the way you do a disk is it's just, you could use the solution, but one way to do it is the solution for the ring problem, use that as the integration variable and just do a bunch of rings. 
as you go from zero to R, the radius of the disk. So that's how you build up, but it's too much to do all of that in class. What I would suggest is that actually doing the rain problem is a much easier problem than what we just did here. I know it doesn't look like you might think that's more complex, but it's not because when you do a ring, a lot of stuff ends up being constant, right? Like for example, the angle theta doesn't change, right? When you have it, because it kind of makes a cone figure as you go around the ring. So that theta, the cosine theta thing, is going to be a constant inside that integral where it wasn't over here. So I would do that. Like I, I could maybe, it only takes a, a few minutes actually to do that problem. So maybe try to do that problem and then maybe look at the disk. And I'll post something maybe this weekend about that. I know I've been saying I'm going to do that, but uh, I actually have a lecture. I think I've already done that. Uh, but I'll talk about that a little bit. So, so yeah, you know, like basically we'll go ahead and finish out the chapter, but this is pretty much everything I wanted to talk about um, in this chapter. We just like doing more of these problems um, and the limiting cases, but that's everything really. It's just a matter of practicing, you know, so you could do a ring, you could do a, a semicircle, like it's all kind of different configurations you can make up, but this is the basis of how you approach these problems. And then you And I believe I did that. Just realized that the earphones were never inside, never plugged in if I came back from break. But let me just take the 15 minutes to uh, go over what I did. I think everything is on the board. So this is what I what we had when I came back. Hopefully you could follow along even without the words. But essentially I wanted to look at the limiting case and it goes back to how you constructed limits from calculus, like chapter three or four, whatever it was. That's all I'm doing here. So what you see is that when I put this in, I get, so I take this, I'm just gonna, these two things are constants, K, E, and Y for the problem. So I don't really need to, well, we're saying Y is not a constant, but you know, Y is not gonna be zero, but I'm taking the limit. And um, I mean, I guess I could multiply the Y through, but in the end, it's gonna be, the, it gets the same result. You, know, you would see that, you could do that if you want. But uh, I'm just going to deal with this invert, this uh, deal here. So here I come over, I'm going to factor out a y squared from that denominator. When I do that, y squared to the square root is just one over y. And then, uh, or, and inside the parentheses, I have one plus one over four. That's the four that was there. And then L squared over y squared. Well, as y gets much, much larger than L, that term goes to zero because you know, you're dividing by a larger and larger number. And so in the end, I'm just left that that whole thing goes to zero and I'm just left with one over y. So in the end, the limit of that, of one over quantity y squared plus L squared over four to the one half power is just equal to one over y. So when I take the one over y and substitute it back in here, then I get KQ over y squared which is, has the form of a point charge, KQ of R squared. And that's what we would expect, as we had said before the break, when I get very far away from this, that's what this, from this charge distribution, it begins to look like a point. So you would expect that the field should look like that of a point charge. Cool. Okay, so that's far away. Now, what about when you get close in? Well, what I was saying is that when you get very close in, like what if Y is a billionth of the length of L? Well, that means that you're so close to this that the ends, you can't see the ends. So they look, they look like infinite line, like an infinite line. So you just go the opposite, you know, you take the, you factor out the L squared. So here I'm factoring out the L squared, L squared over, you know, one over L squared to one half is one over L. And inside I've got the same deal, Y squared over L squared now, but L squared gets much larger than Y. Where it's so it's good, that whole term is going to go to zero. But here I want to be left with L in the denominator, L times one fourth. Well, L times one fourth is one over one fourth, and square root of that is one over one half, and one over one half is just two. So the limit of that deal is just two over L. So, and where L is a constant, by the way. So 
I take that, put it back up here, and basically simplifies to this solution right here. It should be in the J direction. So that's the final solution for that guy, a constant, you know, times one over Y. And what I was showing you over here is that these What I'm showing you over here is that these are basic graphs that you should know. One over X, one over X squared. This, you know, they look a little different. In fact, one over X squared actually should probably look a little bit more like this. Maybe. I don't know, let's look in the book. <laughs> 